Well, good morning again, UPC. If you'd uh, take your, your Bibles on this Mother's Day and turn with me back to the book of Acts. If you are visiting with us this morning, we have been working our way through the book of Acts for the last several months. This morning we come to Acts chapter 10. Verses 34 to 48, Acts chapter 10, verses 34 to 48. This is really a part two of what we started last week with the story of uh, Peter and Cornelius. Today is part two, next week is, is part three as we come to Acts 11. So for now, Acts chapter 10, verses 34 to 48. Acts chapter 10, beginning in verse 34. So Peter opened his mouth, and he said, Truly I understand that God shows no partiality, but in every nation anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. As for the word that he sent to Israel, preaching good news of peace through Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all, you yourselves know what happened throughout all Judea beginning from Galilee after the baptism that John proclaimed, how God appointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. He went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. And we are witnesses of all that he did, both in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They put him to death by hanging him on a tree. But God raised him on the third day and made him to appear. Not to all the people, but to us who had been chosen by God as witnesses, who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. And he commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one appointed by God to be judge of the living and the dead. To him all the prophets bear witness that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. And while Peter was still saying these things, the Holy Spirit fell on all who heard the word. And the believers from among the circumcised who had come with Peter were amazed because the gift of the Holy Spirit was poured out even on the Gentiles. For they were hearing them speaking in tongues and extolling God. Then Peter declared, can anyone withhold water for baptizing these people who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Then they asked him to remain for some days. This is the word of God for the people of God. Let us pray. O Lord, search us and know us. Try us. And know our thoughts. See if there be any wicked way in us. And lead us in the way everlasting. Lead us to Jesus, we pray. Oh Lord, we again thank you for mothers. Today we thank you for how you have raised them up to make and raise disciples in the home. We also give you thanks, O oh Lord, for those who desire to be mothers And yet you have not granted that desire for reasons that we can't understand, things in your infinite wisdom, things beyond our comprehension. Lord, give them every comfort. We pray also, O Lord, for mothers who have have children with Jesus. Lord, we know that they are in the best place they could ever be. So, Lord, we thank you that you do all things well. Lord, bless us now as we hear your word. In Jesus' name, amen. A number of years ago, a movie came out called The 100-Foot Journey. This is a great movie, one that I'm happy to recommend. I never recommend movies up here, but this is, this is one I'm happy to recommend. It's about a family from India that moves from India to a quaint French village and proceed to open up an Indian restaurant. Indian food, Indian culture was deep in their bones, and 
They wanted to share it with the French people. The problem is they opened their restaurant directly across the street, just 100 feet away from a classical French restaurant. And you can guess what happens. A vicious culinary feud erupts between these two restaurants. They compete over local ingredients. They compete over dishes. They compete over compete over clientele and the majority of this movie is about the hundred foot journey these two restaurants learning to cross the aisle to overcome their differences and respect each other and to give it away eventually they do through trial and tragedy they learn to lengthen their tables a hundred feet metaphorically all the way across the road to their enemies. Friends, as we began hearing last week in the beginning of Acts chapter 10, the feud between Jew and Gentile went back centuries. There was layer upon layer of hostile disparity, ethnic, cultural, regional, religious. It was a complex deep-seated feud that nothing could overcome, nothing earthly anyway. Turns out, as we'll hear today in part two, the only thing that can bridge these two warring factions, these two warring restaurants with competing cuisines and competing guest lists, is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit must bridge the gap. The Holy Spirit must make the long hundred foot journey and that's what he does here in part two of this unique encounter between Peter and Cornelius God's command to lengthen the table to call clean what he has declared clean everything we heard about last week is answered as Peter enters into Cornelius's house and he begins to preach the gospel, the Holy Spirit is unleashed upon all who hear. The Spirit, who the Apostle John says, blows like the wind where he wills, blows all the way to the Gentile world, the world of the unclean and the untouchable. And what happens? Well, two competing tables are made into one. See, brothers and sisters, here's the point. As we heard last week, only God can heal the breach, both vertical and horizontal. Only the great King of Kings who sits on the throne can fix the unfixable. Only He can, can breach the unbreachable. It's only through His Word, His promises, His gifts, His tireless devotion to His people that we can not only be disciples, but make disciples. Only He can make that impossible journey. And we know that today because He already has. That's what we're going to unpack today. There's really three parts to this passage, three ways that Christ our King invades our hostile spaces, three ways that he assaults the warring feuds that define our lives and brings hard-fought, yes, costly, yes, but lasting, sustainable, possibly impossible, peace. And we'll take each part in turn. First of all, there's the king's speech. Second, there's the king's gifts. And third, there is the king's devotion. The king's speech, the king's gifts, and the king's devotion. So first of all, the king's speech, this sermon of, of Peter to Cornelius and his house. So you recall the beginning of this story. It all began with twin encounters with God, one involving a Roman centurion named Cornelius and the other the apostle Peter. An angel appeared first to Cornelius telling him to fetch Peter to bring him to his house. He's not told why. He just says, go get him. And likewise, P 
Peter is taken up in a vision, and in this vision he sees this sheet being lowered down from the heavens. And inside are all kinds of animals and birds and reptiles. And as this is happening, God commands Peter to rise, kill, and eat. Peter objects, of course, on the grounds that many of these foods are unclean under the law. And God responds to Peter's objection with a command. And this command is is really uh, a banner hanging over this entire story. Do not call unclean or common what I have declared clean. You see, and this is something Peter didn't understand at first. This vision wasn't about food per se. It was about people. God was opening wide the gate. He was lengthening the table of His grace and mercy even to the Gentiles. So as the story unfolds, Peter is taken to Cornelius' house. He is gathered into a room with Cornelius and all of his guests. So there's Gentiles wall to wall. And what does Peter do? He begins to preach And it's a solid three-point sermon. The first thing he argues is the certainty of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. Peter establishes the Christian faith, in other words, not on a set of philosophical principles or political propositions, not on a set of personal experiences or emotions or even a set of doctrines per se, No, for Peter, our faith is built not on those things, but on things that happen in history, in public, in a particular time and place. Namely, Jesus' life and death and resurrection. As the Apostle Paul will tell Festus later on in Acts 26, our faith as Christians is built not on things done in a corner, but on things that people saw and heard and even touched with their hands. Verse 37, Peter says, You yourselves know what happened throughout all Judea. Verse 39, We are witnesses of all that Jesus did both in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. But we weren't just witnesses, Peter says. In fact, verse 41, We ate and drank with Him after He rose from the dead. In other words, we were there. We saw Him. We heard Him. We ate with Him. And even if you yourself weren't there, you at least know a guy who knows a guy who was there. I mean, these things happened just a few months ago. Jesus lived and He died and and, and He rose and 500 people saw Him alive. And you can go and talk to any of these people. So that's the first thing Peter gets across in this sermon. He establishes the certainty of Jesus' life and death and resurrection. Second, he establishes the universal supremacy of Jesus. Verse 34, Truly, I understand that God shows no partiality, but in every nation, anyone who fears Him and does what is right is acceptable to Him. God shows no partiality. In other words, God doesn't play favorites. We're all on a level playing field before the Lord, he says. There's no nation that gets pride of place. There is no nation that gets a head start. No, Jesus is Lord. He is king over every nation equally. This is something Peter really hammers home here. In fact, notice all the references to all or every in this sermon. If you have a pencil, you can can underline, underline them. Verse 35, every nation. Verse 36, Jesus is Lord of all. Verse 37, all Judea. Verse 38, Jesus went about doing good and healing all. Verse 39, we are witnesses of all that Jesus did. 
The point is, Jesus is not the sovereign of one nation, but every nation. All the peoples of all the nations stand before the King of the universe on equal footing as sinners in need of a Savior. Now just think about for a second what a bombshell revelation this would have been in Peter's day. Think of how exciting but also how disturbing that would have been to hear. I mean, God is exploding here a millennia of assumptions and milieu. He's peeling back layers and layers of cultural and religious baggage, things which still linger on today, by the way, the idea that no nation is God's nation. No nation, no ethnicity, no tribe has pride of place over another. Friends, the truth is, Jesus isn't more Lord of the USA than any other nation. He isn't more providential. He's not more sovereign, more gracious to one people or one skin color over another. I love this country, but this isn't God's country. Unless you're willing to say that every nation is God's country, which it is. He's Lord of all. Now here's the point. This is why this matters. This is why Peter brings this up. If Christ is Lord of all, if all people stand before God with an equal need of His grace and mercy, then our table, who we dine with, who we fellowship with, who we welcome into those doors, needs to be wide. A wide view of God demands a wide welcome. That's what Peter's arguing here. I found it interesting that this is very much the reasoning behind the PCA's statement on racial reconciliation back in 2002. Some of you haven't heard of this, this document. I'd encourage you to go look it up, just a quick Google. The reason the PCA made this statement affirming the need for racial unity is because of this. This is the undergirding theology. It's straight out of Acts chapter 10. Quote, The sovereignty and freedom of grace, the absence of human merit in gaining salvation, and the responsibility to subject all of life to the Lordship of Christ. And again, this is still hard for us. And I'm not just talking about racial harmony, but just playing favorites in general. I mean, kids, how many times have you wondered in the back of your minds whether or not mom and dad were playing favorites with your brothers or sisters? Parents, how many times have you had to reassure your kids that mom and dad don't love so-and-so more just because they get this or that privilege, but that you love all your children equally? We deal with this as adults, too, though. I mean, how much of our lives, our hopes and our fears and our past trauma are built on the cornerstone of partiality? The idea, whether true or false, that you or someone else is getting special favors from a boss or a teacher or a friend or a pastor. This colors our view of God, too. Does God love that person more? Is God partial to that person because they are disease-free and I'm not? Because she had a baby when I couldn't? Because he got the good looks when I didn't? And so... The seeds of distrust are allowed to germinate. Hostility takes hold against God, against our neighbor, all because of this idea of partiality and competition. The Jews felt it. The Gentiles felt it. We feel it today. But then Peter comes along 
with this landmark sermon, Christ is Lord of all, he says. There's not one person, I don't care who they are, who gets special treatment before the Lord. God doesn't look down from heaven on the children of men and see only some who have turned aside. Now what does the psalmist say? All have turned aside. We're all great sinners in need of a great Savior. The arena of grace isn't multi-tiered, in other words. It's not like an awards ceremony. Here's first place, and then second place, and then third place, all based on merit. No, it's all flat. There's no one more deserving than the next. And not only that, but all that existing hostility, all that competition that drives us apart from God and from each other, Jesus took care of, Peter says. Think of that. After all, and really hear me here, what better way, brothers and sisters, for God to prove that He is impartial than that He loved the world and gave His only begotten Son for the world. For people from every tribe, nation, and tongue. What better way to prove that He is Lord of all the peoples than to give His only Son as a Savior of all the peoples. People from North America, South America, Africa, and Asia, and all the rest. What better way to prove that He is Lord of the nations than to give Himself for the nations. And not only that, it doesn't end there. What better reason is there for us to be long-suffering friends, to actively seek reconciliation with our neighbor than the cross? Than the fact that God extends His forgiveness not to the deserving but to His and our enemies. Friends, there's no better reason. So in this sermon, Peter establishes the certainty of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. He establishes the universal supremacy of Jesus. And one last thing. One last thing. He establishes the sending out of the apostles to the nations. Verse 42 And He commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that He is the one appointed by God to be judge of the living and the dead. To Him all the prophets bear witness that everyone who believes in Him receives forgiveness of sins through His name. In other words, follow the logic here. Because Jesus is Lord of all, Savior of all, Judge of all, the apostles have been sent to all. Cornelius, you are not tangential to our mission. No, you are the mission. Now, Jesus is far from done with Cornelius. Jesus not only speaks through his servant Peter in this sermon, he not only proclaims his royal welcome to Cornelius and his house, but he gives him his gifts. That's our next point. The king's gifts. Verse 44, while Peter was still saying these things, the Holy Spirit fell on all who heard the word. And the believers from among the circumcised who had come with Peter were amazed because the gift of the Holy Spirit was poured out even on the Gentiles. Now it's really striking what's happening here. Luke tells us that the Spirit does two things. He first falls in verse 44, and then he's described as being poured out in verse 45. So what's the significance of that? Well, Luke is connecting some dots for us. Remember all the way back at Pentecost that the Spirit was poured out upon the Jews. Then with the Samaritans, Luke told us that the Spirit fell. Well, Luke is explicitly drawing our minds back to these two previous outpourings of the Spirit 
All to say that this third outpouring is not something separate from what happened prior, but very much the climax of all three. In other words, all three outpourings, first to the Jews, then the Samaritans, and now to the Gentiles, are not three separate events, but three parts of one event. Namely, God's mission to pour forth His Spirit on all flesh, to establish His kingdom, to build His church among the nations. Now, why does the Spirit come? What's the significance of this? It's been a while since we were in Acts chapter 2, so it's worth rehearsing, at least in part. Why was it vital for the Spirit to come? Well, to really understand the the sheer cosmic significance of what's happening here, we need to turn to a different passage wherein Paul talks about this. A passage wherein Paul explicitly links Christ's sending of the Spirit with His ascension. Last Thursday was Ascension Day. Next Sunday is Pentecost Sunday. So let's, let's link these two things together. In Ephesians 4, Paul pulls apart Jesus' ascension, and he looks at it through the lens of a great military general who just won a tremendous battle. He's leading all of his defeated captives as slaves in his train. He's marching all the way back to his city. It's this picture of victory. It's this picture of conquest. Well, for Paul, this is what was really going on when Christ ascended into heaven. When Jesus disappeared into those clouds, he was entering triumphantly as the King of kings and the Lord of lords into the throne room of heaven with his defeated foes, death, hell, and Satan as prisoners of war, enemies forever crushed, forever defeated. And unto what purpose? that He might give us His people gifts. As the great conquering King, Jesus gives us gifts. The illustration I've used before is a giant pinata. When Christ ascended up on high, He punched a massive cosmic hole in time and space between heaven and earth, this age and the age to come. And out from this massive hole, poured forth the Spirit and the gifts of the Spirit. In other words, Christ ascended that the Spirit might descend and give gifts to His church. What kind of gifts? Well, these are gifts of heaven. These are new creation gifts designed to build up the body of Christ until we achieve manhood, as Paul says. And what is that manhood? Well, he defines it as the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. In other words, the Spirit is building us up into Christ until Christ is all in all, until He, Christ, is everything in His church. You see, this is why it was better for Jesus to leave. He said in the upper room, it's better better that I go away. Why? Because the paraclete is coming. Because the helper is coming, he says. Someone who's going to do something I can't do in my person as the Son, but something He can do in His person as the Spirit. Something He did all the way back in Genesis 1, which was to build. The Spirit is a builder. He's going to take what I did for you and put it in you. He's going to take what I did and He's going to build my kingdom with it just like He built land and sea back in Genesis 1. You see, this is why the Spirit fell. Why He was poured forth first in Jerusalem and then among the Samaritans and then to the Gentiles. He came to build Christ's kingdom among the nations.
Now notice why all this happens. What's the cause? What prompts the coming of the Spirit here? Peter's sermon. You notice that there in verse 44, there's actually this cause and effect relationship between the king's speech and the king's gifts. You know, there's a reason in the prophets that we find scrolls doing very unscrolly type of things. In the prophets, you know, you find scrolls that are eaten and digested. In one place, you find scrolls even flying around. And why? Because God's Word isn't just paper. No, it's living and active. It doesn't just speak of God's will. It brings it about. Friends, here's the truth, and we see it all throughout Acts. And I'm going to keep banging this drum because Luke does. God's Word alone in all of its sweet simplicity, brings the kind of wholesale transformation that we need. Only God's Word can unleash the power of the Spirit upon the church. I can't do it. You can't do it. Peter couldn't even do it. No, it's only the Spirit working through the Word. So often we try to speak for God instead of just letting God speak. Even when it comes to revitalization, we might be tempted to unleash God's Spirit, to unleash transformation through our methods, our work, our voice. Well, this has to happen here. We have to try this new thing. Well, this should be said and done in this particular way. And only then will the Spirit come upon the church. We have to engineer things just right, and then the Spirit will come. Then we'll get the kind of change that we need in this place. Karl Barth once said this, We must permit our hands to be empty that we may grasp what only empty hands can grasp. Friends, that's the attitude. That's the perspective we need if we want God to do a marvelous work in this place. When it comes to something as miraculous as revitalization, we have to come with empty hands. Yes, be engaged, be in tune, be excited, Be active, but do so with empty hands. Be most concerned with how we can make Jesus Christ front and center. Find ways for you to decrease and for Him to increase. Find ways for the voice of God, for the voice of God's Word to be front and center. None of us need a savior complex. Stop trying to be Jesus. There's only one Jesus, and you're not him. I'm not him. Rather, be animated, be filled up by an earnest, praying expectation of how he, Jesus, the only Jesus there is, will work through his word. That's what we should want. Now, it's one thing for a king to speak to his people, to give his gifts. But in reality, any king can give away gifts without much long-term commitment. Not so with Jesus. Jesus is supremely, eternally, heart and soul, sickness and in health, devoted to his people. We see this all over our passage, but especially here at the very end. This leads to our final point, the king's speech, the king's gifts, and finally, the king's devotion. Verse 47, after this outpouring of the Spirit, Peter declares, Can anyone withhold water for baptizing these people who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? 
And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Now, I wanted to devote a whole point to this, not just because we have a baptism later, but because what we see here in this verse, friends, is the climax, it's the culmination of everything that God showed Peter in that vision of the sheet. It's all there. Here we see Jesus' undying commitment to bless the nations, to gather his elect in from the four corners and give them all the riches of his house, not just in part, but in whole, and not just now, but forevermore. You see, baptism, friends, is not about what I do. It's about what God does. It's not about my commitment to God, but God's commitment to me. It's not about my decision to love God, to stay on the straight and narrow. No, it's about God's decision to love me, to shepherd me, to welcome me at His table, even when I wander from the straight and narrow. And this promise, this commitment, includes... Not just things he's done in the past, things that he is doing in the present, but things that he will do in the future. Baptism is a sacred vow that God will be our God forever. That's the level of his commitment. It's a vow to keep giving us a seat at his table, even if we wander off searching for fast food from time to time. It's a vow to love us all the way to the end. Paul says as much in Ephesians 5, verse 25, talking to husbands. Paul says, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word so that, in other words, we've been baptized, so that in the future he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. Brothers and sisters, this is how much God is committed to revitalization in his church. Not just here, but in every church, in every nation, all around the globe. This is what we're awaiting. This is what God is preparing for us. He's preparing us as a beautiful bride to meet our bridegroom. He's preparing us for the day when we will all walk down the aisle in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, holy and without blemish. Because of me? No. Because of my abiding commitment to Him? No. No. But because of His abiding commitment to me. The Song of Solomon says it best. This is Jesus talking. This is our spouse's love song. You are altogether beautiful, my love. There's no flaw in you. You have captivated my heart. You have captivated my heart with one glance of your eyes, with one jewel of your necklace. How beautiful is your love, my sister, my bride. How much better is your love than wine and the fragrance of your oils than any spice. That's for you, Christian. That's a love song of the bridegroom God for you, his bride. Yes, the church is messy. Yes, things seem to be moving slowly. Expectations aren't fulfilled. Disappointments abound. But remember, amidst this messiness, amidst this mess of misfits and sinners, God is at work. That's his promise. God is busy burning the midnight oil without a break, 
raising up and perfecting his bride. He is that committed to us, UPC. Will you be a part of that? Will you stay the course? Will you endure with us? I pray that you will. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, we know that you are so committed to your church. You love us. You are devoted to us. And Lord, we know that there is no end to this commitment. There's no expiration date. No, Lord, you love us in sickness and in health all the way to the end and even beyond. Oh Lord, we pray that we would receive that love this morning. We would receive that commitment that we would enter into the rhythms of grace that you have called us to. Lord, we pray that we would see that Jesus Christ is Lord of all of every nation under heaven, Lord. And we know that because Jesus gave his own life for the nations. And also so that we might then give ourselves for our neighbor. Lord, help us to do that, we pray. Lord, do a great work in our midst, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you please stand? We respond to the word that we just heard by singing together how sweet and awesome.